um, especially some of those. I can see it's already 7 p.m. So I was just um, having a bit of a moan to Henry about how this was the second time I've done this presentation today and I'm now starting to feel a little bit tired. But it's only two o'clock here, so I've got nothing to complain about. So well done, those of you who are still going strong at 7 p.m. And I hope to make the next half hour enjoyable and quite relaxing for you. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about stories and scaffolded learning. Um, so yeah, first of all, yeah, to introduce myself, which I forgot to do this morning. Um, I'm Viv Lambert, I'm author of um, Story Central and other courses for Macmillan Education. And these are um, primary English language courses. I, I specialise in primary. So um, any questions regarding adults, I'm perhaps not going to be able to answer. However, having said that, I think a lot of what I'm going to say can apply to all age groups and, um, and different levels. Um, so yes, yeah, stories and scaffolded learning. First to start talking about stories, everybody loves a story. When you say to people, can I tell you a story? They automatically pay attention. They actually physically lean in to hear better what you're going to say. They want to know what happened in the story, and what's going to happen next. I bet you've heard several stories already today. I heard a few this morning on the radio, and I think my kids told me a few before they went off to school today. I've actually become really aware or maybe obsessed with thinking about what our stories and where we hear them and how many we hear every day. Or even on Facebook, I noticed it comes up with new story is it when there's a new post on your Facebook page. I actually heard a story the other day when I was walking. I was walking the dog and had my earphones in listening to the radio. And um, it was a story about a man who was fed up with um, human nature and decided to live as a goat for a few weeks. Um, and it was just fascinating. I was stopped in my tracks and, and listened. I really wanted to know what happened in this story. What, what was he going to say? What was going to happen next? And I bet you've heard and told a few stories um, in the last few days as well without even realising it. So storytelling is a shared experience and it's still a very important form of communication, even in today's fast paced and digital world. So children love stories too. And storytelling plays an important role in language lessons. When children are babies, we read stories to them and they're familiar with the conventions of storytelling. And most importantly for language lessons, they can often understand language that's way above their linguistic level when it's in the context of a story. <clears throat> so along with, oh, I forgot to show this slide. This was just my storytelling slide. But along with um, the obvious pleasure we all get from telling stories and listening to the latest gossip, there are many pedagogic reasons for using stories in the language classroom. So stories provide language in a context. And uh, it's, this makes the language more meaningful. It gives children a purpose for listening because they want to find out what's going to happen. There are visual clues in stories. If you're looking at a book, then the clues are the illustrations. Um, you can see a lot, it, which help a lot with understanding what's happening in the narrative. If you have a story, uh, oral storytelling, then it might be the storyteller's facial expressions and gesture that also help you with understanding. Stories have varied appeal. There are so many different stories on different subjects written in different ways and different genres. So there's always something that's going to appeal to everybody. Different 
learning styles and different interests, you're always going to find a story that you like. Many stories have underlying messages, and I'm not just talking about the more obvious fables and folk tales that have morals. A lot of things we read have a kind of underlying message, or perhaps they're stories from different cultures. And within the context of the story, it's easier to approach issues that might be sensitive within other contexts. Stories lead on to creative thinking activities and critical thinking. Just think of the amount of activities you can do before and during and after reading a story. Predicting what's going to happen, giving your opinions about what happens in the story and maybe going on to perhaps write a different ending. There are all kinds of critical thinking activities and many of these lead on to further literacy work, whether further reading or writing. So stories are an excellent source of material in the language classroom. But one extra bonus of using stories is that these can provide a framework or a scaffold to help learners to acquire language in a meaningful and supportive context. So this brings me to scaffolding. Scaffolding is a bit of a buzz term in ELT at the moment, and it's usually or often used to refer to a very kind of general step-by-step -step guidance and support provided by teachers to help children's learning, a little bit like um, builders would use scaffolding around a building and it helps at each stage in the construction. It's not a permanent structure, it's something that can be put up when it's needed and taken down when it's no longer required. But first I thought we should look back at the origins of the term um, scaffolding. Scaffolding as a term is often linked to two psychologists, Bruner and Vygotsky. They believed that we need to provide framework for learning in the classroom and that the teacher or the parent or caregiver, anybody who's teaching a child, needs to be just one step ahead of that child all the time. So the teacher can support and encourage and perhaps provide props to help the learner. And as they progress, the scaffolding can be taken down until the learner can function autonomously. When we speak to children, we scaffold all the time. One of the simplest examples I heard actually was um, perhaps teaching a child to count. Imagine you're teaching a child to count in English. Perhaps they can already count up to 20. But after that, they start to get stuck. Is it one and 20 or 20 and one? What comes next? But by prompting them, or just helping them a little bit, a parent or a teacher or even another child, perhaps an older sibling, can give them a clue, perhaps give them the start of the next word or perhaps write it down or even hold up fingers. So then the child can actually move on and learn a little bit more with your help. So you're doing this every day, supporting, correcting, modelling language, bringing children on from what they know already to what they're capable of knowing with some help from you. This is what Vygotsky called the zone of proximal development. I've tried to show it here on this diagram. So the blue area shows what I can do already and the yellow at the top, what I can't do. And this green area in the middle is what we're talking about. This area that we can, where we can assist children in this area to bring them on further. So this kind of support goes on throughout much of the interaction within a lesson. 
but we're going to look at how to apply some of the principles of scaffolded learning to a lesson in which a story provides the underpinning framework. Now, I gave out this sheet before this webinar, so I don't know if some of you may have seen it already. But on here, on the different coloured cards, are some of the strategies for scaffolding lessons. And what I asked you to do was to try to put the bricks into the tower to build this tower, to complete the tower. I don't know if anybody had a chance to do this before the webinar, but don't worry if you didn't, because we're going to go through this together. We're going to look in practice at a story lesson and see how the learning can be broken into these manageable steps or stages to help them learn. I've chosen a very simple story for the sake of this webinar, and it comes from, uh, from Story Central, which is our new book from Macmillan. This story has a lot of repetition, it's predictable, and the meaning is very clear through the context. Okay, so some people are already giving their answers here. And yes, I think I agree with you. At stage one, I have introduced the story and arouse interest and curiosity. So how are we going to do this? First, I think I might draw attention to the title of the story, The Magic Violin. And actually, we could even play a little bit of violin music. Ask the children to listen to the violin music. How does it make them feel? Maybe they could dance to it even. Do they know this instrument? And look at the picture on the page. Look at this man. What's he wearing? Do they think it's a new story? Or might it be an old-fashioned story, a traditional story? So these are all different questions you can ask to get them interested in the first place. You could perhaps even read the introduction. In our town, there's a man named Tim. He can't drive a cart, but he can play the violin. Somebody saying it makes them feel very happy and cheerful. Good, well, I hope you're going to stay feeling cheerful for the rest of the afternoon. Okay, so let's move on to stage two in the scaffolding process. Stage two, I've put activate prior knowledge and present key language. So this story has a lot of animals and actions in it. So I'm thinking that perhaps we find out which animals they know already and pre-teach maybe any of the new words. So on this slide, you can see some of the animals from the story and some of the actions. I wonder if anybody can link the animals and the actions to try to work out what's going to happen in this story. Maybe the dog can run or the bird can sing. OK, we'll see. So let's make the vocab and the grammar memorable and find out what they already know and teach anything that they don't know yet. At stage three, I've put engage with the story and make predictions. These stages are not set in stone. I mean, you could perhaps do things in a slightly different order. This is just one, uh, one suggestion for how you might scaffold this story lesson. So at stage three, I don't know if you saw this handout as well. I've asked you to predict what you think happens when Tim plays his violin. Can you see this activity on the right here? So what happens when Tim plays his violin? Choose an animal and draw. I don't know if anybody saw this in advance of the webinar or if you have any ideas. But predicting 
what's going to happen is a good way to get children to hypothesize and use their imagination and engage with the story. Okay, somebody thinks the dog will bark. I don't know if I've got any other suggestions coming in here. The cow starts dancing. Okay, or the bird dances. Right, okay, and the dog will start to run. Okay, we're getting lots of good ideas here. Okay, so at stage four, I think we're ready to read the story. And <clears throat> we're going to facilitate understanding or help understanding with verbal and visual clues. So the visual clues are likely to come from the book and the illustrations in the book. Verbal clues are perhaps from a storyteller reading the story out loud. And other visual clues would be the facial expressions and the gestures of the storyteller. And on the way through, we're going to get children to react to the story and maybe even start to participate. We have a video of this story, but I can't actually play it via the webinar. So I'm going to, um, to, to play you the audio. <clears throat> and you may even be able to join in and participate with this story as it's so repetitive. OK. In our town, there's a man named Tim. He can't drive a cart, but he can play the violin. He can sing and dance, this man named Tim, and strange things happen when he plays his violin. Okay, what do you notice about this story, even from the very beginning? Yes, it rhymes. So it's like a poem. It's a rhyming story. <clears throat> Let's see what happens next and see if any of your predictions were right. Look at those fish! Those fish can fly! Fish can't fly. Don't be silly, Tim. Oh, yes, they can. When I play my violin. Look at those birds! Those birds can dance! Birds can't dance. Don't be silly, Tim. Oh, yes, they can. When I play my violin. So can you see what happens when he plays his violin and how surprised the people are? So what do you think is going to happen next? This time we're going to have a look at the picture first to predict what's going to happen. So can you see the cows here? What can the cows do? Yes, so the cows can climb trees. Let's listen to this bit and maybe you can join in now if you feel ready. Look at those cows. They can climb trees. Cows can't climb trees. Don't, Don't be, be silly, silly, Tim. Oh, oh yes, yes, they, they can. can. When, when I, I play, play my violin. violin. Listen to those sheep. Those sheep can sing. Sheep can't sing. Don't be silly, Tim. Oh, oh yes, yes, they, they can. can. When, when I, I play, play my, my violin. violin. But wait, something different is going to happen at the end. What happens at the end of the story? Those dogs, they can skate. Dogs can skate. You're right, Tim. They can skate when, when you, you play, play your, your violin. violin. In our... Oh, sorry. There's a man named Tim. Strange things happen when he plays his violin. So do you see what happens at the end? Yes, children are creative. The little boy is the only one who believes Tim. So in the classroom, I would play this whole thing again and perhaps get the children to join in a bit more, do some more comprehension checks so um, perhaps they could listen again and put the animals from the earlier slide in order and match them to the activities again and see if they match them in a different way. So the next stage, once we've 
actually been through the story and helped them with understanding is level or stage five in my scaffolding. And here I have retell the story and act the story out. Now this story has so much repetition and rhyme, it's a really good one to get the children acting out. And here I've shown how you might group them first into, um, into three groups. So one group could read the narrator's part, another group um, can read Tim's part, and another group all of the people he meets. This way they can sort of use choral repetition and act things out in groups, which gives uh, confidence and supports the weaker students, which in itself is a kind of peer scaffolding. When a stronger group um, helps a, a weaker child, they're, they're scaffolding each other's learning. And then eventually they would probably be able to do a simple story like this as individuals. You might use props, perhaps a real violin or, um, or make a toy violin um, and masks and um, animal masks would be another simple prop to make. And then don't forget about non-speaking roles. In this story, there are fish who can fly, there are dogs who can skate. Some children who might be shyer might prefer at least the first time they go through not to have to speak. So all these animals have non-speaking roles. I think I'd quite like to be a singing sheep if I could choose. So when they're retelling and acting out, they may need the support of props, perhaps even a script, or maybe the audio in the background that they can act along to. So they may need these prompts at first, but then you can perhaps take the prompts away and they, as they become more confident, and they will be able to do the activity on their own. So scaffolding isn't only a vertical thing. The support will come in and out from the side, all the way up the tower, until they're able to produce the language without support. At stage six in my tower, I have analyze issues and give opinions and reflect on underlying messages. Now this story is very simple. You may think it doesn't really have any deeper messages, but actually they can think about any story at a deeper level, going beyond simple comprehension of the story, using higher order thinking skills such as questioning and analyzing. So ask them if they like the story, what's their opinion of this story? What kind of story is it? It's a rhyming story, isn't it? It's a poem, and maybe they know other rhyming stories. And finally, I've put other people kind to Tim. They might actually um, think about, you know, how Tim felt um, when the people didn't believe him. And maybe, you know, maybe the people were a little bit too quick to judge him. And as other people have put in the comments box, I've been trying to read as I go along, you know, that another underlying message is that the children have the imagination and are creative because the little boy was the only one who really believed, believed Tim. But yes, and anything is possible if you have the imagination. Now, it did occur to me that you might have said to me, don't be silly, Viv, when I told you the story at the beginning of my talk about the man who wanted to be a goat. So I wanted to show you these pictures. So here he is. I had to look up the story to find out what happened. He even had these um, prosthetic limbs made so that he could walk around on all fours. He scrambled up and down the mountainside to find better places to graze with the goats. I think his conclusion was that even the goat's life is not an easy one. It's still fraught with challenges. He got cold, he found it hard to get around, and apparently he found it hard to bond with the other goats, perhaps not surprisingly. So this was a story that gripped me recently and I had to find out more. Moving on to the top of our tower at stage seven, 
Some people, I think, have suggested this already, but they can create their own versions of the story and transfer the story to their own experiences. So on the right here, you'll see an activity inviting them to write another verse and then draw. So imagine, imagine you're an elephant, for example. What can you do when Tim plays his magic violin? I'm sure children would have hundreds of ideas here. How about, um, look at those elephants. Those elephants can ride bikes. Elephants can't ride bikes. Don't be silly, Tim. Oh, yes, they can when I play my violin. And here you've got an opportunity to draw a picture of your elephant driving a bike. <clears throat> driving a bike, did I say? Riding a bike, I mean. So, and transferring to their own experiences, you know, what can you do? Can you play, um, can you play the violin? Or have you ever surprised anybody by what you can do? And what would you like to happen if you had a magic instrument? My thought earlier was, I thought, if I had a magic musical instrument, I would like to play it and then all of the housework get done by magic. I know it's a bit of a boring idea, but that's definitely what I would choose. So moving on to the top of the tower. Here's the completed tower. The roof on top suggests an arrow which takes us beyond the story and into project work, further reading and writing, and CLIL. The CLIL project could be, you know, looking at other musical instruments, for example. And there are all kinds of opportunities for literacy work with working on spelling and rhyming words. And also, I wanted you to look before we finish at the colours that I used is tower. You'll notice that there's more blue at the bottom and then gradually it turns to yellow. I wanted this to show that scaffolded learning is an interactive thing between the teacher and the child all the way up the tower. It's a two-way thing. The blue signifies more teacher input and the yellow is the child starting to take responsibility for their learning. With scaffolded learning, the class becomes less teacher centred. It's more of a collaborative thing. Students take responsibility the further they go up the tower. But you're always there. There's always a bit of blue to a certain extent, supporting when necessary, putting up a new bit of scaffolding when they need help, taking it down again when they are confident to carry on alone. So I hope I've shown how stories can be used to help scaffold children's learning in enjoyable and creative ways. Stories can support learning and provide props through images on the page, through gesture and mime, through stimulating the imagination and ideas. The story context can gradually be removed and hopefully the children are left with the language that they can use autonomously. And also they're left with the deeper thoughts and their own opinions about all the issues you raised in the story. The Magic Violin is just one of the many stories from Story Central. In Story Central, there's a story at the heart of every unit and the lessons before the story stage the learning to prepare you for the story and after the subsequent lessons provide this kind of scaffolding. The aim is to assist the learners at every stage when they need it but also to step back and transfer control to the children so that they can develop as creative and free-thinking individuals with their own ideas and opinions. So I hope that um, all makes sense and that you agree that we can use uh, stories in this way to help us scaffold learning in a positive way. And I've got, a, I think I've taken up my half hour, but I do have 
some time here if you want to put any questions into the into the comments box. I've been trying to read some of them along the way. I've had some very nice I've had some very nice comments and some really nice suggestions along the way. But if anybody wants to put in any questions, <clears throat> I'll try and answer them. <clears throat> it's funny, each time I look at this story, I kind of see something else in it, or people draw my attention perhaps to um, other aspects of it. And I think that's the wonderful thing about stories, is that you can read them at various levels just um, for sort of comprehension of the language but also these kind of higher level thinking um, and you can actually you could use that one story for so many different lessons so many different levels <sighs> somebody's asking a question I don't know if they mean to put curl the CLIL is the kind of content language lessons. So I think in in this unit, for example, we do go on to look at um, this. This unit has the the violin in the story, and we do go on to look at different instruments and um, how they're played. Some are played with the hands, and some with the mouth, um, and also different instruments from around the world. Uh, yes, this um, Story Central is for sort of 6 to 12 year olds really and actually this very simple story as I'm sure you can guess is from level 1. You know the language is really simple, you've got the animals, the actions and you've got can and can't so it really is a nice sort of manageable and I chose a simple story to show you um, how I thought this could work but I have tried applying the kind of scaffolding tower to different stories and most of it does work um, sometimes it's difficult to act out a more complicated story but there are always elements of it that you can act out or take a role or you know perhaps write a different ending or there's always something you can do with it if not actually act it out um, there are there stories for 11 year olds somebody asked yes um, we do, um, this goes up to probably about 12 years of age, so you'd want to be looking at level six, and it's also full of stories. At level six is perhaps a little bit more non-fiction, but there's both fiction and non-fiction all the way up. Some nice comments here saying that the books look really nice. Um, <clears throat> and yes, I think using getting them to use English, it's difficult when they're very young. I think you have to, my feeling is that you have to allow for some use of their own language because they, um, if they want to express themselves and you're trying to get them to think at this higher level, they are going to need to use their own language. But having said that, the actual story itself can certainly be done in English. If you pick the right stories at the right level, and you scaffold their learning so you know what they're capable of at each stage, they should be able to cope with the whole story in English. Any more questions popping up there? I probably haven't picked up on all of them, but I'm trying to have a look. Yes, now somebody here is suggesting if they use the mother tongue, you can encourage them by giving examples in English. So yes, you can always model. If it's a contained piece of language, you can model it in English so that and get them to repeat it back to you in English. Um, and this is a, another way of scaffolding, kind of correcting and prompting and modeling on the way through.
There are lots of stories for age seven. Um, if you have a look at levels one and two of Story Central, um, there's actually a reader that goes along with the book, so you can use the reader. And there are also oral storytelling videos, which is what I played you an example from. I wasn't able to show you the video, but yes, it's all there. So there are very different ways to access the stories. You can read them yourself as a teacher. You can have them on the interactive whiteboard so that everyone's looking at the same page and play the audio, or you can play the oral storytelling videos as well. Thank you for the people telling, thanking me. <laughs> I've had some very complimentary comments. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, somebody asking about changing the stages of scaffolding. Yes, I mean, when I came up with the presentation, I found it quite hard to sort of work out exactly a precise order. There isn't a fixed order. I think the whole point is that you're checking at each stage that everybody's got to the same stage. Um, before moving on, but I don't think those stages are set in stone. I mean, you might want to do predicting right from the very start, or you might even want to start off by reading the whole story. I think there are definitely different ways to scaffold, but it's just a matter of making sure that you're aware of what stages you're aiming for so that you can check that your children have um, acquired each stage before you move on. <clears throat> Hi Viv, it's Henry again. Hmm. Hello Henry. Um, thanks for that. I think that's addressed most of the questions, so I'll come back. I'll just turn my camera on. Um, so yes, I think um, you've answered most things that people were asking in the chat box there. And thanks for doing that for us. And um, thanks for being here today and doing the webinar twice. <laughs> really appreciate you giving up your time. Um, That's okay. You're welcome. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, I just want to say yes, thank you uh, for everyone and for being so interactive and putting all your comments in and helping me out with my questions on the way through and some of the questions if I haven't answered I'm sorry but some of them when they're to do with how do I get hold of the books and practical things like that I kind of hand back over to Henry yeah that's I'm fine sorry I'm sorry if I haven't answered everything but I've, and also it's quite hard to see them all because they're all popping up at once yeah but thank yeah. you everybody for for contributing okay thank you again Viv uh, so you can take okay. a well-earned break now. Go and see the dog. <laughs> <laughs> sure, He's right. pacing around behind me. <laughs> okay, thank you, Henry, and thank you, everybody from all over the world. It was really good to uh, to see so many different names from everywhere. Perfect. Thank you once again. Okay, let's bye okay. to Viv now, everyone. <laughs> bye. Bye bye. Bye, Viv. Bye bye. Okay. So, um, as promised, I'm now going to make the um, certificate available for you all to download. So, you should be seeing that appearing on your screen in the certificate box. And all you have to do, if you're able to see it, is click on the PDF file uh, named VIV certificate and then just download it to your device. And what you'll need to do then is print it off and add your name and signature just to prove that you were with us today. The slides are going to be put up on the website as a PDF, so you'll be able to get them as well. And everything today has been recorded, so you can watch back the recorded version. Uh, please let me know in the chat box if you're having any problems uh, accessing the certificate. And if you...
really are struggling, then you can email my colleagues in customer service at help at macmillan.com and they'll get back to you. Uh, I expect the recording will go up um, hopefully by the end of the week by any problems. So you'll be able to go back onto the Macmillan webinar archive and watch it from there. <clears throat> So I'm just going to stay logged in for a bit to allow you time to get the certificate. And uh, while I'm here, I'll share with you the website for Story Central. So you can find out a bit more about the course. And if you go to the page there, uh, you'll see there's a contact us section at the top. And what you can do is there's a drop down menu and you can select the country you're in and then it will take you through to a page with uh, details of local reps who you can speak to. <clears throat> Uh, Ken, just to answer your question, the recording should be 